Moorline Avenue is a small residential street in Clifton. Its name honors a man behind Cincinnati's rich brewing history. In 1842, German immigrant Christian Moorline moved to Cincinnati and set up shop as an accomplished blacksmith. Moorline specialized in making horseshoes and wagon wheels, but it was in the back of his blacksmith shop that his true masterpiece was brewing. Moorline began brewing hearty European beer, and it wasn't long before Cincinnati's large German population grew thirsty for his creation. In 1853, Moorline focused all his attention on brewing and opened the Christian Moorline Brewing Company, which was located in Over the Rhine. Moorline quickly became Cincinnati's most prominent brewer, with thousands of barrels of beer distributed annually. With its unique award-winning taste, Christian Moorline's beer not only became popular throughout the U.S., but also became the only beer in Cincinnati exported internationally. For nearly six decades, the Christian Moorline Brewery dominated the local brewing industry, but the dark days of prohibition pulled the life out of the brewery, forcing the doors to close for good. A few of the buildings still exist in Over the Rhine today, acting as ghosts to the once thriving brewery. But luckily, the recipe was revived and Moorline Beer is back alive in Cincinnati. Moorline Beer was reintroduced to Cincinnati in 1981 using the same four ingredients as the original recipe, malted barley, hops, water, and yeast. The classic beer made famous during Cincinnati's rich brewing past continues to be produced to this day and is a forever reminder to Cincinnati's own brewmaster, Christian Moorline. Soon the Moorline name will grace the banks of the Ohio River as the Moorline Lager House is scheduled to open in early 2012. I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. With Halloween upon us, there's no better story than a ghost story. So in this week's Road Scholar, I am featuring some of the tri-state's most haunted streets. During the day, Eden Park Drive takes you on a scenic trip through Cincinnati's beautiful Eden Park. But at night, don't be surprised if you encounter a ghostly presence by the gazebo at the intersection near Fulton Avenue. It was at this exact spot in 1927 that an infamous Cincinnati bootlegger named George Remus shot and killed his wife Imogene Remus, and her spirit reportedly still roams around in this area. If you head west into Coleraine Township, you might want to think twice about turning down the deserted Lick Road, unless you don't mind coming face to face with a ghost. The story goes that a girl named Amy was murdered by her boyfriend on Lick Road, and reportedly her screams can still be heard. Amy has also been known to write the word help on the windows of curious investigators' cars. Are you scared yet? Well, the next story takes place in Covington, Kentucky, high up in the hills of DeVoo Park. Here on Ridgeway Court in DeVoo Park, supposedly, if you put your car in neutral, ghosts will push you up the hill. So we decided to try it out. With the car in neutral and my foot off the brake, sure enough, the News 5 vehicle slowly crawled up the hill, which leaves behind the question, are ghosts really to blame, or is it just an optical illusion? I guess that's for you to decide if you are brave enough. Well, the Tri-State is filled with dozens of other ghost stories, so next time you turn down a dark, deserted road, don't be surprised if you have your own encounter with a ghost. I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. Fort Thomas Avenue runs through the rolling hills in Fort Thomas, Kentucky. It gets its name from a leading Civil War general and a local military fort. Born a Southerner, General George Henry Thomas decided to go against his family's beliefs and join the Union Army during the Civil War. Thomas was assigned to Kentucky, where he commanded a troop to the Union's first important victory at the Battle of Mill Springs. Over the course of America's bloodiest war, Thomas gained a reputation for being a fearless leader and a battle genius. After the war, General Thomas continued to command several military districts until his death in 1870, but a local military fort brought his name back to life. In 1887, the General-in-Chief of the U.S. Army, Philip Sheridan, surveyed a beautiful hilltop site overlooking the Ohio River with the thought of it being a perfect location for an Army post. In this area, once known as the Highlands, Sheridan selected 111 acres to be the site of a new military fort that he would name in honor of his Civil War companion, General George Henry Thomas. Fort Thomas saw its first action in the late 1890s during the Spanish-American War, where it served as a mobilization point. But with thousands of soldiers contracting malaria while fighting, the entire fort was turned into a hospital to aid the sickened men. During World War I, Fort Thomas served as an important center for recruitment and induction before turning into a training facility during the 1930s. 
By the late 60s, military activity vanished, so the city of Fort Thomas purchased a portion of the facility and turned it into a recreational facility. History. From the still standing armory building to the old mess hall, it's hard not to feel surrounded by the rich history while walking on the grounds of what was once Fort Thomas. I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. Newport, Kentucky is home to some of the Tri-State's most infamous streets. Taking a stroll down York Street or Monmouth Street will lead you straight through Newport's Sin City past. When you think of Sin City, more than likely Las Vegas comes to mind. But before there was Vegas, there was Newport, Kentucky. In January of 1920, the federal ban on alcohol took effect, but it was during Prohibition that Newport rose to fame. The streets of Newport quickly became lined with speakeasies. Combine that with dancing girls and prostitution, and this once small, quiet river town became a city full of corruption. Prohibition came to an end in 1933, but illegal activity in Newport continued when gambling was added to the mix, turning speakeasies into casinos. And with profits soaring, the bright lights attracted some unwanted visitors. A well-known group of gangsters known as the Cleveland Syndicate quickly moved in and took control of Newport using violence and scare tactics. Although the city was now filled with organized crime, the mob turned Newport into one of the premier entertainment destinations in the U.S. During the 1940s and 50s, it was common to see celebrities like Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, and Jerry Lee Lewis walking the streets of Newport and performing at the local clubs. But after nearly four decades of success, the bright lights began to dim in Sin City as reform set in and the streets of Newport were cleaned up. The gangsters eventually left town and Newport suddenly turned quiet, but the city's history full of bright lights, gambling, and corruption will never be forgotten. Dozens of buildings still stand today, like the former Yorkshire Club on York Street and the former Glenn Schmidt Club on Fifth, still holding the secrets to Newport's infamous past. I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. Eggleston Avenue is a wide stretch of roadway that starts at Central Parkway and ends at Sawyer Point. Its name dates back to the pork packing days of Cincinnati. During the 1800s, Cincinnati became the pork packing capital of the United States and gained the nickname Porkopolis. Benjamin Eggleston emerged on Cincinnati's meat packing scene during the mid 19th century with an idea that would take production to a whole new level. Eggleston invented the disassembly line, which was a mechanical system that transported hanging carcasses from one butcher to the next. Eggleston's invention took over the meat packing industry, and years later it became the inspiration behind Henry Ford's creation of the assembly line for the Ford Motor Company. Eggleston's newfound popularity became the fuel for a career shift into politics. After serving a few years on Cincinnati City Council, the Republican was elected into the U.S. House of Representatives and also served as an Ohio State Senator. It was during his time as State Senator that Eggleston had this road named after him, which was once a canal. The Miami and Erie Canal ran straight through what is now Eggleston Avenue, but because of silting due to flooding and high water, this section was rarely used. With the canal owned by the state, Senator Eggleston sold the unused section to the city of Cincinnati for the development of a street. In 1863, this section of the canal was drained, paved over, and named Eggleston Avenue. So from a pork packing legend to a leading state senator, Benjamin Eggleston will forever be remembered in Cincinnati's history. I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. The Taylor Southgate Bridge connects Newport to Cincinnati and gets its name from two prominent Northern Kentucky men. In 1792, James Taylor Jr., the son of a wealthy landowner, moved to Northern Kentucky and built a small log house that he named Bellevue, a name that still exists today. After a few years of clearing land, plotting roads, and developing his settlement, Taylor became the driving force behind the establishment of both Campbell County and Newport, Kentucky. During Taylor's storied lifetime, he operated ferries across the Ohio River, chartered the Newport Bank, and founded the Newport Academy. Taylor also operated saw and grist mills along the Licking River and was the man behind the construction of the Newport Barracks, all leading to Taylor becoming the wealthiest man in Kentucky during his time. In the midst of success, Taylor built and lived in this brick mansion in Newport until his death in 1848, but he wasn't the only prominent man in the neighborhood. Just a few blocks down the road, another brick mansion was home to a leading political figure and businessman named Richard Southgate. Southgate moved to Newport in 1795 and became Campbell County's Commonwealth Attorney. Years later, Southgate took on the role as state representative before moving up the ranks to state senator, where he served until 1821. During the latter half of Southgate's life, he found success manufacturing silk, which he won numerous awards for. 
Southgate passed away in 1857, just nine years after his neighbor, James Taylor, but both men left behind their estates, which are monuments that will keep their legacies alive. So from Southgate, Kentucky to James Taylor Park to the Taylor Southgate Bridge, it's obvious that the names of these men and their contributions will never be forgotten. I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. This weekend marks the 140th birthday of the Tyler Davidson Fountain on Fountain Square. And this week's Road Scholar, I am featuring Probasco Street in Clifton, which is named after the man behind this iconic fountain. In 1835, Henry Probasco and his family moved to Cincinnati in search of new opportunities. At the age of 15, Probasco landed a job as a clerk in a hardware store owned by a Cincinnati businessman named Tyler Davidson. Tyler Davidson saw a lot of potential in his young clerk, and in 1840, Davidson joined together with Probasco as business partners and set out to become the most successful hardware merchants in the city. By the 1850s, Probasco and Davidson's hardware company became one of the largest in Cincinnati, and with profits soaring, Probasco rewarded himself by building a large mansion in Clifton, which still stands here today near Lafayette Avenue. After two decades of success, Henry Probasco and Tyler Davidson began discussing the idea of giving back to the city that made them wealthy. Their plan was to donate a large fountain to the people of Cincinnati, but sadly, Davidson passed away before this could be done. Keeping the plan alive, Probasco traveled to the Royal Bronze Foundry in Munich, Germany, where he proposed his idea for a fountain that would be more beautiful than any other in the United States. After years of detailed sculpting, the completed fountain arrived in Cincinnati, and in October of 1871, in front of 20,000 Cincinnatians, Probasco presented the city with the Tyler Davidson Fountain, named in honor of his business partner. If you would like to celebrate the 140th birthday of the Tyler Davidson Fountain, come to Fountain Square on Friday, October 7th between 5 and 9 for live music and cake from Cervantes. The birthday party is free and open to the public. I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. Well, here's some bonus video for you about another contribution from Henry Probasco. In 1887, Henry donated another fountain to the city, this one right here off Clifton Avenue, and it was used as a drinking fountain. Near the top, there used to be a dipper that passersby could use to drink water from the upper basin. From the lower basin, passersby would allow their horses to drink from this basin here, and the lower basin near the very bottom was used for dogs if they were thirsty on their way home. Now, Henry Probasco himself stopped by this fountain many times on his way home to the mansion near Lafayette Avenue, and eventually he passed away in 1902 after a long life, but he is buried here in Cincinnati at Spring Grove Cemetery. Some call it the Suspension Bridge, others call it the Singing Bridge, but its official name is the John A. Roebling Suspension Bridge, named in honor of its designer. Everyone knows the Brooklyn Bridge, but did you know its precursor is right here in the Tri-State? Few American cities can claim a historic landmark as distinctive as the John A. Roebling Suspension Bridge, which has been a symbol of our city since the 19th century. During the early 1800s, the Tri-State was experiencing an economic boom and a river crossing was needed. Amos Schinkel, a prominent Covington businessman, provided the jumpstart to the city's bridge building plans. In need of an engineer, Schinkel reached out to John Roebling, who was quickly gaining a reputation as a bridge-building mastermind. Roebling studied bridge construction in Germany and brought his knowledge to the United States during the 1830s. After successfully building multiple suspension bridges through New York and Pennsylvania, Cincinnati officials knew Roebling was the man for the job. Roebling broke ground in 1856, starting with construction of the Covington Tower, followed soon after by the Cincinnati Tower. Construction didn't go as planned, though, as financial woes and the Civil War halted the project. In 1863, the unfinished skeleton of the suspension bridge overlooked a small pontoon bridge that Union troops built during the war. It quickly became obvious that a permanent structure was needed, and work finally resumed. Over the next few years, the bridge began to take shape, and construction was officially completed in 1867. So from the beautiful architecture to the unique humming sound, the John A. Roebling Bridge will forever remain a Cincinnati icon. If you'd like to learn more about John Roebling and the suspension bridge, you can do so at Roebling Fest, which takes place on June 25th in Covington. I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. Of 2008, the Cincinnati Reds honored Joe Nuxall by changing the 100 block of Main Street to Joe Nuxall Way as a way to honor the old left-hander's historic career. It's a very surreal thing to see your father's name on a street sign, and it meant the absolute world to him. Joe Nuxall was born and raised in Hamilton, Ohio, and was a three-sport athlete at Hamilton High School. 
While in high school, World War II was in full effect, resulting in the depletion of Major League Baseball's rosters as hundreds of players were drafted into the Army. In need of players, the Cincinnati Reds reached out to young Joe Nuxall, and on June 10th of 1944, he made his Major League debut at the age of 15. In the ninth inning when he came in, he was extremely nervous. Uh, I think almost to the point of, of throwing up. After pitching two-thirds of the inning, Nuxall allowed five runs on two hits, five walks, and one wild pitch. Dad didn't do so well, <laughs> and he got yanked. They sent him back down to the minors, and then uh, eventually he ended up back with the Reds in, in the majors. Nuxall returned to the Reds in 1952, launching a 16-year career. The two-time All-Star posted a career total of 135 wins before retiring in 1966. One year later, in 1967, the old left-hander jumped into the broadcast booth and became the Reds' radio announcer. He is most remembered for his trademark sign-off. The last time, this is the old left-hander, Riley Third, and heading for home. After a 63-year association with the Reds, Joe Nuxall passed away in November of 2007, but his legacy will live on forever. Joe Nuxall is a member of the Cincinnati Reds Hall of Fame, and he'll always have a special place in Major League Baseball history as the youngest person to ever play the game. From Great American Ballpark, I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. Latonia Avenue is a small street in Latonia, Kentucky. It's a name once used by the most prominent people in this area. In the summer of 1829, Ralph Latone, a proprietor of a Cincinnati Western Museum, purchased 57 acres of land just south of Covington and made a remarkable discovery. Latone discovered multiple mineral springs on his new land and quickly took advantage of the opportunity. The mineral springs were located at the present site of where Madison Pike meets Highland Avenue, and it was here that Ralph Latone built the Latonia Springs Resort. The Latonia Springs Resort attracted hundreds of prominent people where they would receive medical benefits from drinking and bathing in the springs. It was during the 1830s that the resort saw its most successful days when wealthy Southerners fled the heat, yellow fever, malaria, and the dreaded cholera epidemic and stayed at Latonia Springs. The resort continued to thrive, but during the Civil War, few people visited Latonia Springs, leading to it closing soon after. But a new attraction kept the Latonia name alive. It was here in 1883 just a few hundred yards away from the old resort that a thoroughbred racing facility was built called the Latonia Racetrack. The Latonia Racetrack quickly became a hit attraction and was once regarded as one of America's top sites for horse racing. With thousands of people visiting the track annually, the town around it flourished and Latonia, Kentucky was established in 1896, once again using the name made famous by Ralph Latone. Although the Latonia Springs Resort and the Latonia Racetrack no longer exist, the origin of the name will forever be remembered through the city of Latonia. I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. Erkenbrecher Avenue leads you straight into the main entrance of the Cincinnati Zoo and is named after the founder of this beautiful attraction. During the 1860s, German immigrant Andrew Erkenbrecher established himself in Cincinnati as a leading producer of starch. Located on the Miami and Erie Canal, Erkenbrecher's St. Bernard Starch Works Company became one of the most successful starch factories in the country, but an unusual occurrence pulled Erkenbrecher's attention away from his business. In 1872, an outbreak of caterpillars destroyed much of Cincinnati's vegetation, but Andrew Erkenbrecher had a solution for the problem. Erkenbrecher and a group of prominent residents imported approximately 1,000 insect-eating birds from Europe and stored them in an old Burnett Woods residence. In 1873, the birds were released from their captivity and successfully ended the caterpillar outbreak. Erkenbrecher noticed people were fascinated with what he did, so he took advantage of the public's interest and founded the Zoological Society of Cincinnati, now known as the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Gardens. The zoo opened in 1875 and started with a small collection of animals consisting of monkeys, birds, deer, and bears, along with raccoons, elk, and buffalo. The zoo also featured a tiger, a hyena, an alligator, and an elephant. Erkenbrecher passed away just 10 years after the zoo opened, but his legacy continues to grow. The Cincinnati Zoo is now home to more than 3,500 plant and animal species, making it one of the largest zoo collections in the country. The Cincinnati Zoo is by far one of the most beautiful places in Cincinnati and is ranked as one of the top zoos in the nation, all thanks to Andrew Erkenbrecher, the man behind it all. I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. Dave Cowan's Drive runs parallel to Riverboat Row and ends at Newport on the Levee. This stretch of roadway honors an NBA legend with local ties. 
Newport, Kentucky native Dave Cowens always had a knack on the hardwood, but it was during his senior year at Newport Central Catholic that his star began to shine. Cowens took the Thoroughbreds basketball team to the state tournament in 1966, averaging 13 points and 20 rebounds, stats that showed a bright future in basketball. After high school, Dave Cowens took his talents to Tallahassee, where he played for Florida State University. In three seasons at Florida State, Cowens averaged 19 points per game and pulled down 1,300 rebounds, solidifying himself as a dominant big man. NBA scouts drooled over Cowens' abilities below the basket, and during the 1970 draft, the former NCC thoroughbred was selected fourth overall to the Boston Celtics. During his first year in the NBA, Cowens was named Rookie of the Year. A few years later, he was named MVP, two honors that gained him respect in the league. After a decade in the NBA, the six-time All-Star racked up 13,000 points and 10,000 rebounds, giving him a first-class ticket to the Hall of Fame. Cowens retired as a player in 1983, but eventually returned to the league, serving two stints as an assistant coach and two as a head coach. Because of his work ethic, consistency, versatility, and energy, Dave Cowens will forever be remembered as one of the most respected centers in NBA history. Dave Cowens is proof that the Tri-State produces some pretty incredible athletes just like me. I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. Mary Ingalls Highway, also known as Kentucky Route 8, follows the Ohio River through Campbell, Bracken, and Mason counties in Kentucky. Well, the story behind the name involves a heroic struggle for freedom. It was a warm Sunday in July of 1755, and 23-year-old Mary Ingalls was going about daily work on her family farm in Virginia. But it was no ordinary day. Shawnee Indians ambushed the farm, killing and capturing everyone in sight. Mary Ingalls was dragged hundreds of miles away to a Shawnee village on the banks of the Ohio and Scioto Rivers near what is now Portsmouth, Ohio. During the month-long trek, Mary Ingalls memorized landmarks and kept a mental note about the river she followed, already planning her escape. Ingalls was soon moved to another Indian camp located at what is now Big Bone Lick State Park in Kentucky. It was an eerie place where fog cleared way to mastodon bones protruding from the swampy, sulfurous saltwater. The horrifying location gave Ingalls the immediate urge to escape. One early October morning in 1755, Mary Ingalls was foraging the woods for food and found herself in a perfect opportunity to sneak away. With only a tomahawk and tattered clothes, Ingalls disappeared into the forest and set out for what would be an 800-mile trek home. Mary Ingalls followed the Ohio River on her journey home, and the Mary Ingalls Highway was built right on top of her exact path. After 42 days, Ingalls finally arrived home with her body skeletal and her hair white despite her young age. She soon recovered and went on to live a long life before passing away in 1815. Although her visit to our area wasn't enjoyable, Mary Ingalls will forever be remembered as the first white woman to set foot on our tri-state soil. From the Boone County Library, I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. Observatory Avenue is a scenic stretch of roadway that runs through Hyde Park and ends here in Alt Park. It gets its name from one of America's first observatories here in Cincinnati. So we, were, we call ourselves the birthplace of American astronomy because we got everybody going. We got it started. During the early 1800s, the United States had a strong interest in astronomy but lacked an organized observatory with a powerful telescope. It was Cincinnati College professor Ormsby McKnight Mitchell that took the first step forward when he conducted a series of public lectures on astronomy and shared his plan for an observatory. He must have been some dynamic speaker. He was like the Carl Sagan of the 1800s that really got people interested in astronomy. Mitchell's plan was to form the Cincinnati Astronomical Society, and after gaining the public's interest, 300 members were obtained and the society became official in 1842. With money raised from the society, Mitchell traveled to Germany where he inspected and purchased the world's most powerful telescope, the Merce and Mahler Refractor. Upon his return to the U.S., Mitchell's Astronomical Society received four acres of land on Mount Ida, now Mount Adams, from Cincinnati winemaker Nicholas Longworth. In 1843, the cornerstone for America's first major observatory was laid by former President John Quincy Adams, and Mount Adams was named in his honor after the ceremony. Two years later, construction on the Cincinnati Observatory was complete just in time for the arrival of the new telescope, which went into operation on April 14th of 1845. This telescope was good for looking at double stars and identifying new, new stars that haven't been seen before, but it was also as the claim to fame for seeing Neptune for the first time. After two decades of groundbreaking space investigations, the University of Cincinnati took over control of the observatory and moved it to Mount Lookout, where it still stands today. 
The Cincinnati Observatory not only has an amazing place in Cincinnati's history, it also has a special place in American history as part of the foundation for our nation's space explorations. I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. Mearing Way runs along the Ohio River in downtown Cincinnati. Its name honors a Cincinnati police lieutenant who was known for having eyes in the sky. It's a bird, it's a plane. It's Police Lieutenant Art Mearing, Cincinnati's first helicopter traffic reporter. In 1958, WLW Radio introduced airborne traffic reports to Cincinnati with Mirin as the eye in the sky. Mirin's traffic reports were an instant success and were later aired on WLW TV for all to see. Mirin quickly became a Cincinnati celebrity, and one story goes that grateful motorists would flash their headlights when they would see the helicopter approaching. In 1960, Popular Science Magazine named Lieutenant Mirin Cincinnati's favorite radio commentator, whose duties included more than just reporting traffic. In between traffic, Traffic reports, Lieutenant Mearing would aid in police work, chasing down bank robbers, reporting on fires, and even landing his helicopter at accident scenes to direct traffic. Mearing became a hero when he took to the sky during a search for a missing 12-year-old girl. The lieutenant and his pilots spotted the girl in a wooded area, and she was quickly rescued. Lieutenant Mearing's popularity grew yet again during the 60s when he hosted a kid safety program on WLW-TV called Signal 3. The man known as Copter Cop retired in 1967 and sadly passed away one year later at the age of 54 after battling an extended illness. As he did for over a decade, Lieutenant Mearing will forever look over our city from the sky above. As a traffic reporter myself, I have a lot of respect for Art Mearing, and his legacy is something we can all learn from. I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. When you see or hear the name Finley, more than likely you think of Cincinnati's famous Finley Market, but there is more to the name as it dates back to the beginning of Cincinnati. During the height of the Indian attacks on our newly established city, James Finley, a young entrepreneur, took a risk and moved to Cincinnati in 1793. At the time, Cincinnati was experiencing rapid population growth and Finley took full advantage of the opportunity, opening a general merchandise store near the banks of the Ohio River. In the midst of his store success, James Finley also served as the mayor of Cincinnati in 1805 and 1810. Finley was pulled away from Cincinnati during the War of 1812, commanding a regiment near Detroit. Following the war, Finley served in the U.S. Congress before returning focus to his Cincinnati business. With profits from his retail business, James Finley purchased land just outside of Cincinnati city limits, and in 1833, a new town was born called the Northern Liberties, an early foundation for what is now the northern portion of Over the Rhine. The new land opened up space for a farmer's market, the original concept behind what is now Finley Market. Finley had plans to build a public market and general store on his new land, but died in 1835, putting a halt to construction. Executors of the Finley estate donated a parcel of his land to the city of Cincinnati, specifying that it be used to build a public market named for and commemorating James Finley. Finley Market is a gem for our city, and we truly appreciate James Finley's contributions. From Finley Market, I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. Harrison Avenue runs from South Fairmont all the way to West Harrison. It's a long road named after America's shortest serving president. William Henry Harrison's storied life began on February 9th of 1773 in Berkeley, Virginia. With a father who signed the Declaration of Independence, Harrison grew up in a prominent family with high expectations, expectations that drove him to a successful career. In 1791, Harrison joined the Army and was sent to Cincinnati where he eventually became captain and commander at Fort Washington, which was right here next to Lytle Park. Harrison's leadership during the Northwest Indian War sparked a career in politics. In 1798, President Adams appointed Harrison Secretary of the Northwest Territory, and two years later he was named Governor of the Indiana Territory, where he served for 12 years. But it was during the War of 1812 that Harrison became a national hero when he defeated a British and Indian force at the Battle of Thames River, a move that took his political career to the next level. After the war, Harrison served in the U.S. House of Representatives and became an Ohio State Senator before retiring to his farm in North Bend, Ohio in 1829. While on his farm, Harrison became active in organizing the Whig Party in opposition to the Democratic Party. In 1840, the Whigs nominated Harrison for president, and at the age of 68, he won the election and became the ninth president of the United States. Upon his inaugural address in Washington, Harrison decided not to wear a hat or coat despite the freezing cold March weather. 
Days later, Harrison caught a cold, which turned into a severe case of pneumonia. And exactly one month after taking office, Harrison died on April 4th of 1841, becoming the shortest serving U.S. president. William Henry Harrison was buried near his home in North Bend, Ohio, with a towering monument honoring his legendary life. He will forever have a special place in our tri-state and nation's history. I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. Buttermilk Pike is a heavily traveled roadway in northern Kentucky. The name dates back to the 19th century and literally has rich history. During the 1800s, the land now known as Crescent Springs and Villa Hills were home to a dozen family farms, but a select few specialized in dairy production. Three dairy farms were located in what is now Villa Hills, and their former locations might surprise you. Today, this area is known as Amsterdam Village, but 150 years ago, it was home to the Echo Dairy Farm. A few hundred yards away, two more dairy farms were in operation, one located on the current grounds of Villa Madonna Academy, the other located in what is now the Tears Landing subdivision. The local dairy farmers all used the same one-lane dirt road to transport their milk. That dirt road was located underneath what is now Buttermilk Pike. The bumpy ride down the dirt road in the horse-drawn wagons became problematic during the summer months. As the milk bounced around in the hot, humid weather, it would thicken from all the churning. As a result, the milk turned into buttermilk. So after decades of dealing with this ongoing problem, locals decided to name the roadway Buttermilk Pike in light of the complicated times. Luckily, Buttermilk Pike is now smooth asphalt concrete, so no worries if you take a glass of milk on the go. I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. With Independence Day weekend upon us, it's the perfect time to look at Jefferson Avenue in Coryville, which honors the man behind the Declaration of Independence. During the second half of the 18th century, the American Revolution was in full effect when 13 colonies joined together to break free from the British Empire. It was American patriot Thomas Jefferson that played one of the most valuable roles during the war, not only fighting for freedom, but also serving in the First and Second Continental Congress. Members of the Second Continental Congress selected Thomas Jefferson to write the Declaration of Independence, which declared freedom from Great Britain. In the Declaration, Thomas Jefferson wrote arguably one of the most well-known sentences in U.S. history. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Independence from Great Britain was declared on July 4th of 1776 when Congress adopted the Declaration, but freedom wasn't officially granted until 1783 at the signing of the Treaty of Paris, which ended the American Revolution. During the next 30 years, Jefferson served as Secretary of the State under George Washington, became Vice President to John Adams, and served two terms as President. One of his major accomplishments was the Louisiana Purchase, which nearly doubled the size of the United States, but he will forever be remembered for declaring our freedom. So on Independence Day, not only should we celebrate our country's birthday, we should also honor the principal author of our freedom, Thomas Jefferson. I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. Montague Road and DeVue Park Road meet right in the heart of DeVue Park, both names of families with rich history on this land. Long before DeVue Park, a Covington pastor and Boys Academy teacher, Reverend William Montague became one of the first settlers on the land. In 1833, Montague purchased 700 acres of land on the hilly terrain overlooking northern Kentucky and built a large house that was located on the present site of the DeVue Park Golf Course Clubhouse. Two Montague generations used this land for farming, but in the early 1870s they fell into financial hardship and sold their homestead. William DeVue, a successful hat maker from Cincinnati, purchased the Montague estate in 1872 for $11,000, adding to his recently acquired land. DeVue moved his family to northern Kentucky during the 1860s and bought a federal-style farmhouse located just a few hundred yards from the Montague's property. DeVue architecturally remodeled the farmhouse, and it was in this home that they raised their children, William and Charles DeVue. William DeVue Jr. grew up to be the successful brother of the two, making millions in the real estate business. But one thing the brothers had in common was their close relationship with their parents. William and Charles DeVue wanted to forever honor their parents. So in 1910, the brothers donated the family estate to the city of Covington for use as a park. Charles DeVue continued to live in the family home and served as the park superintendent until his death in 1922. William DeVue Jr.'s death followed 15 years later, but to keep the family's name alive, William decided to leave the bulk of his money to DeVue Park in order to maintain his family's legacy.
From the still standing DeVu family home to the beautiful landscape in the park, it's obvious the DeVu family legacy will live on forever in DeVu Park. I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. Gilbert Avenue runs straight through the heart of Walnut Hills, connecting to downtown Cincinnati. Well, the man behind the street name played a valuable role in our city's early infrastructure. During the 1850s, Cincinnati became the sixth largest city in America. It was a growing metropolis destined for greatness. In need of a mastermind to oversee the developing infrastructure, Cincinnati called upon city surveyor Alfred Gilbert and promoted him to city civil engineer. As city engineer, Gilbert oversaw dozens of construction projects, but one of his most well-known projects was the building of Finley Market. Gilbert completed Finley Market in 1855, but beautifying our city wasn't his only responsibility. He was also in charge of developing what lied beneath the city. During the mid-19th century, Gilbert got down and dirty as the engineer in charge of sewer construction for Cincinnati. Next to the street that bears his name, Gilbert built the Eggleston Avenue sewer, which carried runoff from the Miami and Erie Canal to the Ohio River. After a decade of contributions, Gilbert resigned as city engineer and became a colonel in the American Civil War. Gilbert's Civil War duties didn't last long, though, as he was severely wounded during the Battle of Corinth, so he returned home and went back to work as city engineer. After another decade of improving our city, Alfred Gilbert retired in 1873 and enjoyed the rest of his life on his Fairfield Township farm. He will forever be remembered for his valuable services to our city. From construction of Cincinnati landmarks to developing our city sewers, Alfred Gilbert had a hand in it all. I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. Hamilton Avenue runs between Fairfield and Northside. It's a name with more than 200 years of history and is tied to an American legend. The name Hamilton has been a part of our city from the very beginning. During the late 18th century, Arthur St. Clair, the governor of the Northwest Territory, moved to Cincinnati and established one of the first counties. They named it Hamilton County in honor of American leader Alexander Hamilton, who at the time was the first secretary of the treasury. Hamilton rose to fame as George Washington's chief of staff and gained respect as the chief author of the Federalist Papers, which convinced the fractured populace to ratify the Constitution. As a founding father of these United States, he was widely admired. Although Alexander Hamilton never personally had a connection to Cincinnati, his name continued to grace our city out of respect for his valuable contributions to America. Hamilton's name was used again in 1791 when Arthur St. Clair ordered construction of a fort north of Cincinnati. He named it Fort Hamilton. Three years later, a town began to rise around the fort's boundaries, which developed into what is now Hamilton, Ohio. The use of Alexander's name didn't stop there. In 1830, construction began on a thoroughfare that would connect Cincinnati to the city of Hamilton. It was named Hamilton Avenue. So from counties to cities to major roadways, Alexander Hamilton's name will forever be a part of our city. Well, this time I thought I was the man behind the name. Well, we now know the name Hamilton comes from a United States founding father. I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. Ruth Lyons Lane is just a small alleyway in downtown Cincinnati, but the woman behind the name left behind a legacy larger than life. Decades before Oprah, a Cincinnati broadcast pioneer, Ruth Lyons, was captivating audiences with her genuine personality and ability to make people laugh. Let us entertain you. Let me make you smile. Ruth Lyons began her radio broadcasting career during the 1930s at Cincinnati's WKRC. Lyons' prestige grew during the Great Flood of 1937 when she broadcasted live and calmed viewers. And as we rode around in this boat, we rode over the tops of the street lamps. Years later, Lyons was hired by WLW and created a popular show called The 50 Club, later changed to The 50-50 Club. The program simulcasted on WLW Radio and WLW TV, and in 1951 it aired nationally on NBC for 11 months before returning to its local status. Guests included famous musicians, movie stars, political figures, and more. After a career that spanned four decades, Ruth Lyons retired from broadcasting in 1967 and focused attention on her charity, the Ruth Lyons Christmas Fund, now known as the Ruth Lyons Children's Fund, which provides gifts for hospitalized tri-state children. Ruth Lyons passed away in 1988, but her legacy lives on forever here in Cincinnati. 
Ruth Lyons was a remarkable woman, and she will forever be remembered for her caring heart and as a premier broadcaster. From WLWT Studios, I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. The Brent Spence Bridge is arguably one of the most important transportation links in the tri-state. Well, the man behind the name also had a significant importance to our area. Some say great leaders are outgoing and good public speakers. Well, Newport, Kentucky native Brent Spence possessed neither of the two qualities, but still excelled in his leadership roles. It was his quiet, impartial demeanor that earned him the trust of Republicans and Democrats alike. Spence began his political career in 1904, serving in the Kentucky Senate, followed by becoming a city solicitor for both Newport and Fort Thomas. Spence was praised in 1920 by the Amalgamated Steelworkers Union when he helped negotiate an end to the infamous Newport Steel Strike. After 12 successful years as a city solicitor, Spence took his leadership national and served 32 years as a United States congressman. As one of Kentucky's longest serving congressmen, Spence was able to make valuable connections which greatly benefited the tri-state. Brent Spence was an ally for Franklin Roosevelt and used that influence to convince federal officials to build a new airport in Boone County, Kentucky. During the latter years of Brent Spence's life, he became chairman of the House Committee on Banking and Currency and locally championed public housing for low-income families and procured funds for flood walls in northern Kentucky. After a long and rewarding career, Brent Spence retired in 1962. One year later, a new bridge was built and named in his honor. Well, next time you drive across the Brent Spence Bridge, take a second to remember the importance of the man behind the name. I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. Dozens of notable guests have stayed at the Golden Lamb Inn, including 12 United States presidents, and some, they say, have never checked out. The Golden Lamb Inn is the oldest hotel in Ohio. With more than 200 years of history within these walls, it's no surprise that a few lost spirits still linger in the shadows. Well, there, there have been a number of staff members who have told me they have experienced things. Uh, uh, DDR, Assistant General Manager, has told me that she was in the Buckeye Room and swears that uh, someone was breathing down her neck turned around to tell them off and there was nobody there. Could this have been the spirit of celebrated U.S. Congressman Clement Vallandigham? In an unfortunate accident, Vallandigham fatally shot himself in what was then room 15 on the second floor. Uh, so if anybody has a right, as I said, to wander these halls, it would be the spirit of Clement Vallandigham. According to staff members, the Golden Lamb is also haunted by a little girl named Sarah Stubbs, who lived and died on this property. Sarah's room is said to be the most active room at the Golden Lamb, and her lonely spirit roams the halls looking for someone to play with. A few years ago, a family had their own encounter. They were waiting in the lobby, and the little boy turned to her and said, Mom, can I play with that little girl? And the mother said, what girl? The one by the staircase in the white dress. Other guests have reported seeing a very thin and bony man with grayish skin color roaming the halls at night, possibly the spirit of Charles Sherman, who died of typhoid fever at the Golden Lamb Inn. Although some people don't experience anything during their stay, it's still an unnerving feeling to realize that the ghosts of the Golden Lamb Inn are always watching. If you are brave enough to spend the night, contact the Golden Lamb Inn for pricing and availability. Just remember, you will not be alone. Brandon Hamilton, News 5. Before Muhammad Ali and Sugar Ray Leonard were knocking people out, a Cincinnati boxer named Ezra Charles was busy emerging as a champion. Ezra Charles was born in Lawrenceville, Georgia on July 7, 1921 and moved to Cincinnati at the age of nine. Charles began his amateur boxing career in his teen years and set the stage for his honorable career. After 42 amateur fights, Charles posted an undefeated record. He really came along slowly and that was the key to it because he was had time to hone his craft and learn the techniques of boxing. In 1940, 20-year-old Ezra Charles, known as the Cincinnati Cobra, became a professional boxer and immediately moved up in the ranks, winning his first 15 fights. A few years into his professional career, he faced his toughest opponent, World War II. Charles served in the military for two years before jumping back into the ring in 1946. After moving into the heavyweight division, Charles defeated famed fighter Jersey Joe Walcott to win the National Boxing Association Championship. And on September 22nd of 1950, Charles defeated Joe Lewis and was proclaimed the world heavyweight champion. Particularly winning over Joe Lewis to unify the title, and that sort of marked him as a true world champion then. That was the high point of his career. 
After nearly two decades as a professional boxer, Ezra Charles hung up the gloves in 1959, ending his legendary professional boxing career with a total of 96 wins. Cincinnati later honored this Hall of Fame boxer by renaming Lincoln Park Drive to Ezra Charles Drive in remembrance of one of the greatest boxers of all time. I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. The street names like McCormick, McMicken, and O'Brien, it's hard not to notice Cincinnati's rich Irish history. During the 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries, millions of immigrants migrated to the United States hoping to live the American dream. In Ohio, Irish immigrants were among the earliest settlers, but in the 1840s, Cincinnati saw its largest spike in Irish population as a result of the potato famine in Ireland. They were starving to death when the blight hit the potato. So um, the Irish could not get jobs, they could not really survive, so they did everything they could possible to get enough fare to go to, to America. Most Irish immigrants hoped to make their way as farmers here, but without any money they took any job they could find, usually the least desirable jobs, like laying railroad tracks and cobblestone roads, as well as digging canals. With a hand in the construction of our city, the Irish enhanced our cultural and social landscapes, creating the beautiful city we call home. By the 20th century, the Irish were the second largest group in Cincinnati behind the Germans, and even today they make up 10% of our population. The Irish came to Cincinnati and embraced all aspects of life, and their contributions are present to this day. If you want to learn more about Cincinnati's Irish history, the Irish Heritage Center here in Columbia, Tusculum is a great place to start. I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. In Hyde Park and Mount Lookout, you might notice street names like Alt Park Avenue, Alt View Avenue, and Alt Park Drive, all of which are named after a successful entrepreneur from Cincinnati. During the late 19th century, printmaking experienced a boom when newspaper lithographics, glossy magazines, and posters became the predominant mode of graphics. Levi Alt, a Cincinnati black ink salesman, noticed the high demand for ink manufacturing and took full advantage of the opportunity. Alt teamed up with fellow investor Frank Weiborg and together they launched the Alt & Weiborg Company in 1878. Levi Alt hoped to become the leading producer and distributor of ink and lithograph supplies. That hope quickly turned into reality. After five years, the Alton Wyborg Company became one of the leading distributors of ink in America, and by 1928 they were the international leaders with plants and operations on four continents. At the peak of success, Alt sold the business during the latter days of his life, but that is not all he is remembered for. Levi Alt played a major role in Cincinnati's park system, serving as chairman for the Cincinnati Board of Park Commissioners. He generously donated 204 acres of his land to our city, now home to Alt Park. He is regarded as the father of Cincinnati Parks. Well, next time you're enjoying the beautiful scenery in Alt Park, the name will have more of a meaning to you. From Alt Park, I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. Green Up Street in Covington, Kentucky is lined with historic properties and a few local eateries. But who is the man behind the street name? His name is Christopher Greenup. Christopher Greenup was born in Virginia in 1750. As a young adult, Greenup studied law and served in the Revolutionary War as a lieutenant before taking on the rank of colonel. Greenup's first connection to the Bluegrass State came in 1781 when he helped settle what is now Lincoln County, Kentucky, which back then was still a part of Virginia. Greenup was active in working to separate Kentucky from Virginia and statehood for the Bluegrass State was declared in 1792. Christopher Greenup's leadership started a new chapter in his life, leading him to a career in politics. Soon after Kentucky's admission to the Union, Greenup moved to Frankfurt and became a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, where he served for five years. Greenup's connection to Kentucky grew stronger near the turn of the century, serving as a member of the Kentucky House of Representatives and as the clerk of the Kentucky State Senate. But his greatest achievement came in 1804, when he became the third governor of Kentucky. During his tenure, Greenup helped charter one of the Commonwealth's first banks in Frankfort, Kentucky. Despite Greenup's popularity, much of his proposed agenda didn't pass, which included provisions to Kentucky's public education and reforms to the state's court and revenue systems. Following his tenure, Greenup returned to his roots in law before his death in 1818. Greenup County, Kentucky is named in his honor. Well, next time you're exploring the rich history or having a bite to eat on Green Up Street, you will be able to impress your friends with a history lesson about the man behind the name. I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. It takes quite a legacy to have a massive structure like this named in your honor. Daniel Carter Beard's legacy was larger than life, so there's no better way to honor this unique pioneer. Well, Dan Beard had a very accomplished life, Brandon. Uh, 
He uh, was a writer, he was an illustrator, uh, he wrote children's books. Uh, for his day, he was something of a rock star. Daniel Carter Beard was born in Cincinnati, Ohio on June 21st, 1850. His family soon after moved into this home on East 3rd Street in Covington, Kentucky, located at the confluence of the Ohio and Licking River. It was during his explorations through these woods that sparked his interest in the outdoors. Beard began his early career as a civil engineer before quickly losing interest. In 1880, he enrolled in the Art Students League of New York. In need of financial support, Daniel Carter Beard became an author and illustrator of magazines and books with more than 20 under his name. He was also a very gifted uh, artist. In fact, he was Mark Twain's artist of choice when Mark Twain published Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. In 1905, he began a new career path which led to one of his biggest achievements. Beer took on the role as an editor for the children's sections of the wildlife periodical recreation magazine and pictorial review magazine. This career led to his founding of two youth groups called the Sons of Daniel Boone and Boy Pioneers, basing them on the American frontier traditions. The popularity of his youth groups grew quickly, and in 1910, Beard became a founding father for the Boy Scouts of America. As Beard grew older, his achievements grew stronger, establishing the Distinguished Eagle Scout Award and becoming president of the Campfire Club of America. His involvement with the Boy Scouts came to an end upon his death on June 11, 1941, just shy of his 91st birthday, but his legacy will live on forever definitely an amazing legacy. So next time you drive across the Daniel Carter Beard Bridge, you'll have more appreciation for the man behind the name. I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. Fort Washington is a name that dates back to the beginning of Cincinnati. It was all a part of the building blocks used to establish our city. In 1788, three men purchased 800 acres of land along the Ohio River. A town was born, Los Antoville, now known as Cincinnati. The town grew quickly and needed security. Under the command of United States Army General Josiah Harmar, a fort was constructed to protect the early settlements. Its name, Fort Washington, named in honor of who else? President George Washington. Placing Fort Washington here in Cincinnati provided security, attracted additional settlers. Uh, it also provided business opportunities. Fort Washington was located in present-day downtown Cincinnati. If you look at the present-day street grid, it was located roughly east of Broadway and between 3rd and 4th Streets. Yep, Fort Washington was roughly 200 feet per side, including the walls and block houses at the corners. So not huge by today's standards, but it was a very substantial, a large and substantial fort in that day. In December of 1789, General Josiah Harmar and 300 soldiers launched an expedition against the Native Americans in Northwest Ohio. Then, in October of the following year, General Harmar's army was ambushed and defeated by Native Americans. The raids came very close to Cincinnati. In fact, one story goes that a blacksmith for Fort Washington was captured, stabbed, and scalped by the Indians near the present site of Music Hall. A peace treaty was finally signed August 3rd of 1795. Fort Washington continued to protect the city until 1803 when it was replaced by the Newport Barracks in Kentucky. In 1808, the abandoned Fort Washington was demolished and the land was converted into lots, streets, and avenues, the footprint of our developing city. Although Fort Washington no longer exists, this monument on Arch Street just south of East 4th Street stands on the former grounds as a reminder to the fort that once protected our city. I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. In the tri-state, the name Lytle might sound familiar to you. We have the Lytle Tunnels, Lytle Park, One Lytle Place, all of which are named after a prominent family from Cincinnati. Captain William Lytle came to Ohio in 1780 during the Revolutionary War. Although his stay was brief, the visit set the stage for his family's legacy here in Cincinnati. Captain Lytle's son, William Lytle II, moved to Cincinnati in 1808. As a land surveyor, Lytle accumulated a fortune and was a leading contributor to the founding of Cincinnati College, now known as the University of Cincinnati. The Lytle family legacy continued with William Lytle II's son, Robert Todd Lytle. Robert Todd was a U.S. congressman. He was a lawyer and he was considered a rising star. Sadly, just when Robert Todd Lytle started making a name for himself, he lost his life to tuberculosis at the age of 35. Luckily, he had a son, William Haynes Lytle, who started a fourth generation of contributions to Cincinnati. He was a lawyer. He um, was with the state legislature. He went on to, he fought in the Mexican War 
Lytle also fought in the American Civil War, moving up the ranks to become a Brigadier General. At the Battle of Chickamauga, William Haynes Lytle was mortally wounded. He is buried at Spring Grove Cemetery with a towering monument honoring his heroic life. The Lytle family estate, which stood at the present site of Lytle Park, was demolished during construction of the Lytle Tunnels. That area of our city is now dedicated to the Lytle legacy. William Haynes Lytle never married, therefore he left no direct descendants behind, but the Lytle name will live on forever in Cincinnati. From Spring Grove Cemetery, I'm Brandon Hamilton, News 5. Pig is right around the corner and Eden Park Drive is a scenic stretch on the course that takes you through Cincinnati's beautiful Eden Park. Where the name Eden comes from might surprise you. During the early years of Cincinnati, the hilly terrain, now known as Mount Adams, was considered inaccessible and was ignored for nearly four decades. Nicholas Longworth, a distinguished Cincinnati citizen and winemaker, saw potential in the beautiful landscape and purchased large tracts of land on the hill. With the new land, Longworth established a lush grape vineyard and named it the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden was located right in the heart of what is now Eden Park, and it helped Longworth become one of the leading distributors of wine in the nation. The vineyard thrived with Catawba grapes in which Longworth used to produce a popular champagne known as Golden Wedding. Roughly 100,000 bottles were sold a year. A famous poet, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, heard about the Garden of Eden and was inspired to write a poem after tasting Longworth's champagne. In the poem, Wadsworth refers to Cincinnati as a queen, and some say our nickname, the Queen City, comes from this poem. During the 1850s and 60s, Longworth was at the peak of success, but an outbreak of black rot and mildew destroyed his vineyards, including the Garden of Eden. With Prohibition and the Civil War in full effect, Longworth decided not to revive the vineyards, ending his successful run. He will forever be remembered as a father to the American wine industry. Well, the Longworth family eventually donated the Garden of Eden to the city of Cincinnati, now home to Eden Park. We all know how frustrating it is when we get lost or are given wrong directions. Well, forget MapQuest. WLWT.com will get you there on time.